Hi, and welcome to Foreign Affairs Focus. I'm Jonathan Tepperman, the Managing Editor of Foreign Affairs. With me today is one of the country's leading experts on North Africa, and especially Libya, Dirk van der Waal. Dirk also happens to be the, article, the author of a great article in the upcoming issue of Foreign Affairs, which is already available at foreignaffairs.com, uh, called After Gaddafi, The Surprising Success of the New Libya. Dirk. Uh, the first question, and it's the question I assume on everyone's mind since the tragic events of uh, a few weeks ago, um, uh, how has the attack in Benghazi changed uh, the overall story of Libya, if at all? Your narrative, the one you, um, the, the case you make in your argument is, is positive, that it, it, Libya is in fact on a pretty surprisingly dramatic upward trend. Um, does this recent spasm of violence change things or not? I don't really think so. I mean, my point in the article was that there is cautious optimism. Uh, but as I also pointed out, there are lots of areas where uh, the Libyan government still really does not control the country. Uh, it does not really have the traditional monopoly of violence that you would expect a government to have. Um, and within the kind of persisting low-level chaos that has existed in the country um, ever since the Civil War, uh, you have uh, certain small groups, uh, rogue militias in many ways, um, that have taken advantage um, of the security, the, the, the lack of security um, in the country um, and have organized. Uh, and so what we saw was really um, that, in a sense, this fell between the cracks. No one had really watched this. Uh, and, of course, they were able to organize and, of course, were able uh, to launch this operation against uh, the, the consulate. Now, after the attacks, we saw this remarkable upswell of public opposition to the militias and in fact in I think two cases mobs of ordinary citizens took on the militias and kicked them out of their bases. Is this the beginning of a trend um, and is the government capitalizing on this new sentiment by cracking down on the militias? Well that sentiment actually was there before um, these incidents and the the intervention, the Western intervention, was uh, very warmly greeted uh, in uh, Libya. Uh, and of course, there are kind of lingering warm feelings, particularly toward the United States. Now, Ambassador Stevens was a, an extraordinary individual uh, in that he was an Arabist. He knew the country very well. Um, he liked to get around. This was not the kind of uh, image that we have of the traditional ambassador. Um, and so his death, in a sense, uh, really sent a shockwave because Libyans were really interested in making sure that the West understood also that they were a moderate country, that they didn't really want uh, radical Islamists, uh, that, as a matter of fact, any party um, that threatened to kind of overwhelm the political system uh, would not come into power. And so suddenly to have uh, the ambassador, a beloved figure um, in Libya, uh, get killed by an extreme group uh, within Libya was really um, a shock uh, to Libyans and certainly uh, to Libyan officials. But is the government using this as an opportunity to really crack down on the militias and to start to lay down that monopoly of violence that, as you point out, is, is, is lacking and is critical if Libya is going to keep advancing? Well, it's a little more complicated than that because you really need to distinguish in Libya between uh, the legitimate uh, militia, that is, uh, militias that have fought in the civil war and then remained as militias after the civil war, and then what I would call rogue militias, smaller militias that really very opportunistically took uh, advantage of the lack of security in the country, organized them, and essentially operate as mafia-type organizations. Um, now, the problem is, um, or one of the lingering issues in Libya is that the government actually relies on some of these legitimate militias, the Tuwar as they're called, um, to provide security for areas where it cannot yet provide order and security. Um, and so, ironically, one of the militias that was uh, attacked in the aftermath of the death of Ambassador Stevens was a militia that was actually working for the government, helping to provide security. So it's a little more complicated uh, than it appears uh, uh, from the outside. Lay out, if you would, the um, four or five other critical factors um, uh, or pieces of evidence that you, that you use in your piece um, to make the case that Libya is moving in a good direction, starting with the election. Well, the election certainly um, were the, the 
first step of a, a process of legitimacy that I think is continuing uh, in Libya, the handing over of power from the traditional national council, from the transitional national council to uh, the now created national uh, assembly um, is the second one. You know, this was a plan that had already been described in the roadmap that the TNC devised during the civil war. So those are just two of the instances. The, a third example is, of course, what you alluded to, and that is um, the, this enormous uprise in uh, essentially civil society within Libya, something totally unexpected that has been very, very outspoken, very forceful uh, in support of democratization. So those are three major examples, I think, of where Libya um, really is, is sui generis. It's really, a, in, in a sense, um, all by itself. One of the most striking uh, aspects of your article is that you argue that uh, what many people see as uh, a real handicap um, or expected to be a handicap for, for Libya, namely the fact that it had effectively no institutions because Qaddafi had so successfully obliterated them during his, his uh, reign, has turned out to be an advantage. Explain that if you will. Well, if, if you think, for example, to Tunisia and Egypt, uh, one of the real big problems in both countries was that any reform really had to dislodge what were some very powerful groups within uh, both countries, in, in both cases, for example, the military. Um, and so traditionally, we had all thought um, that in Libya, uh, the fact that you had no institutions at all would be very problematic because you would really start with a tabula rasa. Well, what we've seen is actually that it's been the opposite, um, that because you don't have to remove all these obstacles, it's relatively easy to start from the ground up and build uh, these institutions. And again, why I think um, Libya will be substantially different from the other um, Arab uprisings. Given these differences, do you think there are any lessons from Libya that can be taken and applied to um, the Tunisia, or Egypt, these other countries in transition? Well, I think Libya also, for example, um, has really profited quite handsomely from a very responsible leadership, a leadership that was willing to look outside for expertise, a leadership that was willing to compromise to some extent. Um, and so um, leadership has been very important. And certainly, I think some of the other countries can learn a lot of what the leadership did. Uh, but also the fact um, that that leadership very carefully over a relatively long period of time that really goes back to the Civil War thought very very strategically already, and of course that's very hard to do now for other countries because they're already uh, trying to de devise solutions. Uh, but what it means is that in, in Libya uh, you really had kind of a luxury that uh, other countries didn't have. They had the luxury of sitting down and think very systematically through solutions uh, before the end of the Civil War. So what advice would you have for Washington, if any? What can the United States be doing differently? What more should it be doing to help Libya make the transition? Well, actually, the United States has been very supportive. Uh, our involvement uh, during the conflict, but particularly our involvement after the conflict, has been what I would uh, describe as warm and supportive. Uh, and certainly Ambassador Stevens, for example, also um, realized that these initiatives, and we were working on an, in an initiative, for example, uh, uh, to bring an educational uh, research center to Tripoli, that these are very, very important. Um, so my um, uh, advice to Washington, if I may, would be continue with these initiatives, particularly in light of what happened with Ambassador Stevens. We shouldn't step back, that it's continued involvement uh, with Libya that is certainly very much appreciated by the Libyans and that is really necessary to keep pushing the country uh, toward, uh, hopefully, uh, a more democratic future. Well, Professor Van der Waal, thanks so much for talking to Foreign My Affairs. My pleasure.